Chapter Forty Six of Ten Years Later. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eden Ray Hedrick. Ten Years Later by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter Forty Six Aramis's Correspondence. When de Guiche's affairs, which had been suddenly set to right without his having been able to guess the cause of their improvement, assumed the unexpected aspect we have seen, Raoul, in obedience to the request of the princess, had withdrawn, in order not to interrupt an explanation, the results of which he was far from guessing, and he soon after joined the ladies of honor, who were walking about in the flower-gardens. During this time, the Chevalier de Lorraine, who had returned to his own room, read de Wardes's letter with surprise, for it informed him by the hand of his valet of the sword-thrust received at Calais, and of all the details of the adventure, and invited him to inform de Guiche and Monsieur, whatever there might be in the affair likely to be most disagreeable to both of them. De Wardes particularly endeavoured to prove to the Chevalier the violence of Madame's affection for Buckingham, and he finished his letter by declaring that he thought this feeling was returned. The chevalier shrugged his shoulders at the last paragraph, and in fact, Duardes was out of date, as we have seen. Duardes was still only at the Buckingham affair. The chevalier threw the letter over his shoulder upon an adjoining table, and said in a disdainful tone, "'It is really incredible, and yet poor Duardes is not deficient in ability. But the truth is, it is not very apparent, so easy it is to go rusty in the country.' The deuce take the simpleton, who ought to have written to me about matters of importance, and yet he writes such silly stuff as that. If it had not been for that miserable letter, which has no meaning in it at all, I should have detected in the grove yonder a charming little intrigue, which would have compromised a woman, would might perhaps have been as good as a sword-thrust for a man, and have diverted monsieur for many days to come. He looked at his watch. "'It is now too late,' he said. One o'clock in the morning, every one must have returned to the king's apartments, where the night is to be finished. Well, the scent is lost, and unless some extraordinary chance. And thus saying, as if to appeal to his good star, the chevalier, greatly out of temper, approached the window, which looked out upon a somewhat solitary part of the garden. Immediately, and as if some evil genius was at his orders, he perceived returning towards the chateau, accompanied by a man, a silk mantle of a dark colour, and recognised the figure which had struck his attention half an hour previously. "'Admirable!' he thought, striking his hands together. "'This is my providential mysterious affair!' And he started out precipitately along the staircase, hoping to reach the courtyard in time to recognise the woman in the mantle and her companion. But as he arrived at the door of the little court, he nearly knocked against Madame, whose radiant face seemed full of charming revelations beneath the mantle which protected without concealing her. Unfortunately, Madame was alone. The chevalier knew that since he had seen her, not five minutes before, with a gentleman, the gentleman in question could not be far off. Consequently, he hardly took time to salute the princess as he drew up to allow her to pass. Then, when she had advanced a few steps, with the rapidity of a woman who fears recognition, and when the chevalier perceived that she was too much occupied with her own thoughts to trouble herself about him, he darted into the garden, looked hastily round on every side, and embraced within his glance as much of the horizon as he possibly could. He was just in time. The gentleman who had accompanied Madame was still in sight, only he was hurrying towards one of the wings of the chateau, behind which he was on the point of disappearing. There was not an instant to lose. The chevalier darted in pursuit of him, prepared to slacken his pace as he approached the unknown, but in spite of the diligence he used, the unknown had disappeared behind the flight of steps before he approached. It was evident, however, that the man pursued was walking quietly, in a pensive manner, with his head bent down, either beneath the weight of grief or happiness, when once the angle was passed, unless, indeed, he were to enter by some door or another, the chevalier could not fail to overtake him. And this certainly would have happened if, at the very moment he turned the angle, the chevalier had not run against two persons, who were themselves wheeling in the opposite direction. The chevalier was ready to seek a quarrel with these two troublesome intruders, when, looking up, he recognized the superintendent. Fouquet was accompanied by a person whom the chevalier now saw for the first time. 
This stranger was the Bishop of Vaux. Checked by the important character of the individual, and obliged out of politeness to make his own excuses when he expected to receive them, the Chevalier stepped back a few paces, and, as M. Fouquet possessed, if not the friendship, at least the respect of every one, as the king himself, although he was rather his enemy than his friend, treated M. Fouquet as a man of great consideration, the Chevalier did what the king himself would have done, namely, he bowed to M. Fouquet, who returned his salutation with kindly politeness, perceiving that the gentleman had run against him by mistake, and without any intention of being rude. Then, almost immediately afterwards, having recognized the Chevalier de Lorraine, he made a few civil remarks, to which the Chevalier was obliged to reply. Brief as the conversation was, de Lorraine saw, with the most unfeigned displeasure, the figure of his unknown becoming dimmer in the distance, and fast disappearing in the darkness. The Chevalier resigned himself, and, once resigned, gave his entire attention to Fouquet. "'You arrive late, monsieur,' he said. "'Your absence has occasioned me great surprise.' and I heard Monsieur express himself as much astonished that, having been invited by the king, you had not come. It was impossible for me to do so, but I came as soon as I was free. Is Paris quiet? Perfectly so. Paris has received the last tax very well. Ah, I understand you wish to assure yourself of this good feeling before you came to participate in our fate. I have arrived, however, somewhat late to enjoy them. I will ask you, therefore, to inform me if the king is in the chateau or not, if I am likely to be able to see him this evening, or if I shall have to wait until to-morrow. We have lost sight of his majesty during the last half-hour nearly, said the chevalier. Perhaps he is in madame's apartments? inquired Fouquet. Not in madame's apartments, I should think, for I just now met with madame as she was entering by the small staircase and unless the gentleman whom you a moment ago encountered was the king himself and the chevalier paused hoping that in this manner he might learn who it was he had been hurrying after but fouquet whether he had or had not recognized de guiche simply replied no monsieur it was not the king the chevalier disappointed in his expectation saluted them but as he did so casting a parting glance around him and perceiving m colbert in the centre of a group he said to the superintendent, "'Stay, monsieur, there is some one under the trees yonder who will be able to inform you better than myself.' "'Who?' asked Fouquet, whose nearsightedness prevented him from seeing through the darkness. "'Monsieur Colbert,' returned the chevalier. "'Indeed? That person, then, who is speaking yonder to those men with torches in their hands is Monsieur Colbert?' "'Monsieur Colbert himself.' He is giving orders personally to the workmen who are arranging the lamps for the illuminations. Thank you, said Fouquet, with an inclination of his head, which indicated that he had obtained all the information he wished. The chevalier, on his side, having, on the contrary, learned nothing at all, withdrew with a profound salutation. He had scarcely left when Fouquet, knitting his brows, fell into a deep reverie. Aramis looked at him for a moment with a mingled feeling of compassion and silence. "'What?' he said to him. "'The fellow's name alone seemed to affect you. "'Is it possible that, full of triumph and delight as you were just now, "'the sight merely of that man is capable of dispiriting you? "'Tell me, have you faith in your good star?' "'No,' replied Fouquet dejectedly. "'Why not?' "'Because I am too full of happiness at this present moment,' he replied in a trembling voice. "'You, my dear D'Herblay, who are so learned,' will remember the history of a certain tyrant of Samos. What can I throw into the sea to avert approaching evil? Yes, I repeat it once more. I am too full of happiness, so happy that I wish for nothing beyond what I have. I have risen so high, you know my motto, quo non ascendem? I have risen so high that nothing is left me but to descend from my elevation. I cannot believe in the progress of a success already more than human." Aramis smiled as he fixed his kind and penetrating glance upon him. "'If I were aware of the cause of your unhappiness,' he said, "'I should probably fear for your grace. But you regard me in the light of a true friend. I mean, you turn to me in misfortune, nothing more. Even that is an immense and precious boon, I know. But the truth is, I have a just right to beg you to confide in me, from time to time, any fortunate circumstances that befall you, 
in which I should rejoice, you know, more than if they had befallen myself. My dear prelate, said Fouquet, laughing, my secrets are of too profane a character to confide them to a bishop, however great a worldling he may be. Bah, in confession? Oh, I should blush too much if you were my confessor. And Fouquet began to sigh. Aramis again looked at him without further betrayal of his thoughts than a placid smile. Well, he said, discretion is a great virtue silence said Fouquet. yonder venomous reptile has recognized us and is crawling this way colbert yes leave me d'herblay i do not wish that fellow to see you with me or he will take an aversion to you aramis pressed his hand saying what need have i of his friendship while you are here yes but i may not always be here replied Fouquet dejectedly on that day then if that day should ever dawn said aramis tranquilly we will think over a means of dispensing with the friendship or of braving the dislike of m colbert but tell me my dear Fouquet, instead of conversing with this reptile as you did him the honour of styling him a conversation the need for which i do not perceive why do you not pay a visit if not to the king at least to madame to madame said the superintendent his mind occupied by his souvenirs yes certainly to madame you remember continued aramis that we had been told that madame stands high in favour during the last two or three days it enters into your policy and forms part of our plans that you should assiduously devote yourself to his majesty's friends it is a means of counteracting the growing influence of monsieur colbert present yourself therefore as soon as possible to madame and for our sakes treat this ally with consideration but said fouquet are you quite sure that it is upon her that the king has fixed his eye at the present moment if the needle has turned it must be since the morning you know i have my police very well i will go there at once and at all events i shall have a means of introduction in the shape of a magnificent pair of antique cameos set with diamonds i have seen them and nothing could be more costly and regal at this moment they were interrupted by a servant followed by a courier for you monseigneur said the courier aloud presenting a letter to fouquet for your grace said the lackey in a lower tone handing aramis a letter and as the lackey carried a torch in his hand he placed himself between the superintendent and the bishop of vaughan so that both of them could read at the same time as fouquet looked at the fine and delicate writing on the envelope he started with delight those who love or who are beloved will understand his anxiety in the first place and his happiness in the next he hastily tore open the letter which however contained only these words it is but an hour since i quitted you it is an age since i told you how much i love you and that was all madame de bayere had in fact left fouquet about an hour previously after having passed two days with him and apprehensive lest his remembrance of her might be effaced for too long a period from the heart she regretted she dispatched a courier to him as the bearer of this important communication fouquet kissed the letter and rewarded the bearer with a handful of gold as for aramis he on his side was engaged in reading but with more coolness and reflection the following letter the king has this evening been struck with a strange fancy a woman loves him he learned it accidentally as he was listening to the conversation of this young girl with her companions and his majesty has entirely abandoned himself to his new caprice the girl's name is mademoiselle de la valliere and she is sufficiently pretty to warrant this caprice becoming a strong attachment beware of mademoiselle de la valliere there was not a word about madame aramis slowly folded the letter and put it in his pocket fouquet was still delightedly inhaling the perfume of his epistle monseigneur said aramis touching fouquet's arm yes what is it he asked an idea has just occurred to me are you acquainted with a young girl of the name of la valliere not at all reflect a little ah uh, yes i believe so one of madame's maids of honour that must be the one well what then well monseigneur it is to that girl that you must pay your visit this evening bah why so nay more than that it is to her you must present your cameos nonsense you know monseigneur that my advice is not to be regarded lightly but this unforeseen that is my affair pay your court in due form and without loss of time to mademoiselle de la valliere 
I will be your guarantee with Madame de Belliere that your devotion is altogether politic. What do you mean, my dear d'Herblay, and whose name have you just pronounced? A name which ought to convince you that, as I am so well informed about yourself, I may possibly be just as well informed about others. Pay your court, therefore, to La Valliere. I will pay my court to whomsoever you like, replied Fouquet, his heart filled with happiness. Come, come, descend again to the earth, traveller in the seventh heaven, said Aramis. Monsieur Colbert is approaching. He has been recruiting while we were reading. See how he is surrounded, praised, congratulated. He is decidedly becoming powerful. In fact, Colbert was advancing, escorted by all the courtiers who remained in the gardens, every one of whom complimented him upon the arrangements of the fate, all of which so puffed him up that he could hardly contain himself. "'If La Fontaine were here,' said Hoquet, smiling, "'what an admirable opportunity for him to recite his fable of the frog that wanted to make itself as big as the ox.' Colbert arrived in the centre of the circle blazing with light. Fouquet awaited his approach, unmoved, and with a slightly mocking smile. Colbert smiled, too. He had been observing his enemy during the last quarter of an hour, and had been approaching him gradually. Colbert's smile was a presage of hostility. "'Oh, oh,' said Aramis, in a low tone of voice to the superintendent. "'The scoundrel is going to ask you again for more millions to pay for his fireworks and his coloured lamps.' Colbert was the first to salute them, and with an air which he endeavoured to render respectful. Fouquet hardly moved his head. "'Well, Monseigneur, what do you say? Have we shown our good taste?' "'Perfect taste,' replied Fouquet, without permitting the slightest tone of raillery to be remarked in his words. "'Oh,' said Colbert maliciously, "'you are treating us with indulgence.' we are poor we are servants of the king and fontainebleau is no way to be compared as a residence with vaux quite true replied fouquet coldly but what can we do monseigneur continued colbert we have done our best on slender resources fouquet made a gesture of assent but pursued colbert it would be only a proper display of your magnificence monseigneur if you were to offer his majesty a fate in your wonderful gardens in those gardens which have cost you sixty millions of francs seventy-two said fouquet an additional reason returned colbert it would indeed be truly magnificent but do you suppose monsieur that his majesty would deign to accept my invitation i have no doubt whatever of it cried colbert hastily i will guarantee that he does you are exceedingly kind said fouquet i may depend on it then yes monseigneur yes certainly then i will consider the matter yawned fouquet except except whispered Aramis eagerly. "'You will consider,' repeated Colbert. "'Yes,' replied Fouquet, "'in order to know what day I shall submit my invitation to the king.' "'This very evening, Monseigneur, this very evening.' "'Agreed,' said the superintendent. "'Gentlemen, I should wish to issue my invitations, but you know that wherever the king goes, the king is in his own palace.' It is by his majesty, therefore, that you must be invited. A murmur of delight immediately arose. Fouquet bowed and left. Proud and dauntless man, thought Colbert, you accept, and yet you know it will cost you ten millions. You have ruined me, whispered Fouquet in a low tone to Aramis. I have saved you, replied the latter, whilst Fouquet ascended the flight of steps and inquired whether the king was still visible. End of chapter 46